Esberg, and he is going to do the scripture invocation. Pray. Amen. Thanks. Thank you, Pastor Randolph. I would like to read from the book of Ezra, reading a few verses, and then Ezra chapter 5. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord, of God, Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek God as you do, we, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Isa Adon, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers of Israel said to them, You may do nothing with us to build a house for God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah, and they troubled them in the building and hired counselors against them to frustrate the purpose all the days of Cyrus, the king of Persia, until the end of the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. Verse number 24. Thus, the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased and was continued until the second year of the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. Chapter 5, verse 1. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edu, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God which is in Jerusalem and the prophets of God were with them helping them we live in a time when there are many voices that have been sent and commissioned against the building processes of God for our lives our development our sharpened skill in prophetic utterances and understandings is necessary for the building and the establishing of divine purpose. Voices were raised that weakened the hands of, of the builders, that hindered the process. But we, in this time and season, have gathered here to have our ears opened again, to have our understandings enlightened, to hear the word of the Lord, and to allow the prophetic to give direction and to rebuild to re-establish, yes. to re-energize, yes. and to redirect the body to its purpose. So as we lift our hands, it is to that end we have gathered today. We want prophetic proficiency. We want an understanding of the voice of the Lord in us. We do not want to be discouraged. We do not want to, to walk in error. We do not want to have the building processes of God stifled or hindered. Uh, but we desire today momentum. Uh, we desire strength. Uh, we desire resourcefulness. Uh, so, Father, as we come before you this morning, uh, we bend our hearts, we bow our knees, uh, we humble ourselves before you, uh, and we declare, let the word uh, that comes from your throne uh, begin to be released to us uh, at this conference today. Uh, may we be skilled, may we be tooled, uh, may we be a re reawakened, uh, Father, to the intent uh, and the desire of the Father for us. Uh, we declare today uh, that our ears are submitted, uh, our hearts are surrendered, uh, and we are ready to receive uh, of your counsel. Uh, Father, we are living in a time uh, of great disillusionment, uh, of great deception. Uh, great darkness covers the earth. Uh, but I thank you that even as these prophets arose uh, and prophesied into their context uh, and prophesied uh, over the people that strength uh, and grace uh, and healing was, was, was brought about uh, that restored the passion to build uh, that gave direction that increased the energy yes. 
and resourcefulness uh, of your people. Um, So we dedicate ourselves to you this morning uh, as we sit, uh, as we listen, as our hearts are exposed to the counsel of heaven this morning. uh, Reinvigorate us, we pray. uh, Sharpen us, equip us, give us all the tools that we need today to begin again, to build into your purpose for our lives. We thank you, we bless you, we honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Amen. Just greet somebody, high five someone in the right place at the right time for the right purpose. Amen. We can ask Carla and the team to lead us in worship. Amen. Say to your neighbor this morning, family, you've got to discern the times that you're in. Amen. You've got to see it. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together with us this morning. Do you see what I see? What I see, say, I see lightning. I see lightning. I hear thunder. Something stirring six feet under. Something stirring six feet under. Dead things coming back to life again. Dead things coming back to life again. I believe there's about to be another resurrection.
really about what you see, amen, because even if paradise is flung wide open, you got to behold, amen, amen, what God is doing. Hallelujah, amen. Bless his name, hallelujah. It's about the resurrection of dead things, amen, hallelujah. Oh, clap your hands. Your God, we offer your word this morning, oh God. We want to hear from you, oh God. We want you to speak, oh God. Cherish every part 
our prayer today father we came here with nothing we come in absolute humility we lay down all preconceived notions fears anxieties and we rest in your presence I thank you that you've permitted some of us to be crushed and to be pressed so that new wine and new oil might flow and in the crushing and in the pressing, you are producing new wine. Where there's new wine, there's new power. Everyone lift your hands. I just pray, Father, saturate every mind, every soul with the sense of your orchestration and your custody over personal processes that each of us are going through. Nothing is without, beyond your scope, nor your management. You are the administrator of the affairs of our lives. And we come this morning to lay it all down before you in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Father, that today, this weekend, will be a brand new weekend for many of us. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, a very good morning to one and all. It's difficult to get people out on a Saturday morning. The fact that you came denotes your hunger and your thirst for a deeper place in God. I want to warmly welcome each and every one of you individually. Um, please know that you are highly valued. You are highly honored in Christ. And we value your presence here in the midst of us. Amen. Just tell your neighbor we are one. Amen. 
and um, both our local congregation here and the many guests and visitors from outside of the Gate Ministries household of faith here, we want to accord each of you a very, very special welcome in the Lord. This set of meetings was impressed upon our hearts some time back, and I know up to leading to this occasion, there have been highly uncanny set of processes, events, and circumstances that we've been, ex been experiencing personally, and I'm sure as much as you have, that have led to today. Everyone say this after me, today, today. when you hear his voice, Amen. do not harden your heart. Nobody arrives at a today moment abstractly, outside of context. And I sense very strongly that today is the day that the Lord has made. We must rejoice and be glad in the day of the Lord. John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he said, come up higher. Jesus said, I must work the works of him while it is yet day. For night comes when no one can do sent work. No one can do apostolic work. I must do the works of him who sent me. Everyone say he sent me. Right? And I want to encourage you to when you hear his voice. This day when he says, come up higher and I will show you. Do not harden your heart as to the impress of God. Because um, a, a word that God gave us, we met this whole week at the church. We've been praying at 5.30 a.m. And the central verse was Ezra 9 and verse 8, where he said, for to us, a brief moment of grace. Everyone say a brief moment of grace. A brief moment of grace has been opened up. And to enlighten our eyes and to give us a little reviving in our time. I've been encouraging our local church that in the brevity of a moment, if you posture yourself correctly of grace, you could unlock momentous doings of the Lord. One moment can lead to momentous change. But it all has got to do with what do you do in the moment of God's opportunity. So tell your neighbor you are in a brief moment of grace. And I say these things, I've been repeating it to our local church each day this week, because I do not want a nonchalant attitude. I don't want a casual flippancy present in this conference, God's going to speak and we're going to respond. Amen. And our response is going to be positive. Our response also will not be delayed and not be deferred because we value the speaking of the Lord. And he says, do a thing now, adjust now, adopt now, decide now. Then we do it in the moment. Everyone say, do it in the moment. Right? So this is that moment. And it's built up to this point as we've discerned the speaking of the Lord. And so I want to welcome each of you. Um, if you're a minister of the gospel, I don't want to mention all your names. If you're um, a leader of a household of faith or one of the Ascension Gift Ministries, can you stand? I just want to call you a special welcome. Pastor Salvador and others, Leon, Pastor Ivan, I see you there. Pastor Esme, I see Winston at the back there. Pastor Winston from the Assemblies of God. Um, yes, welcome. Wonderful to have you. Did not I teach you? Hallelujah. I'm looking at you now. I can see your face in the classroom. Sitting on the left-hand side of the classroom in the corner there. Wow, amazing. <laughs> Let's give our guests a wonderful hand of, of welcome. Amen. Wonderful to, to see and have each and every one of you are highly valued. Our program for today is as follows. We're going to have two one-hour, 15-minute sessions. Everyone say we are serious. We value this time. We've cordoned it off to engage God speaking. Amen. We will have one session now, and then we're going to have a 30-minute tea and snack break. Um, and then after that, we will, when you hear the music, the worship, please come back. We'll just do one worship song, and we'll go straight into session two. After session two, you're all invited and welcome to stay for Briani. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We'll serve you first spiritually, but we also want to serve you naturally. Amen. So we're very strong in the South on fellowship and eating and meeting. We spell meeting M-E-A-T-I-N-G. Amen. And uh, the kingdom is not meat and drink, as you know, but righteousness, peace and joy 
but you need meat and drink to facilitate a context of covenantal joinings and relationships. And that will take place in the adjacent room here. I see so many of you I haven't seen in ages. It's wonderful to see and to have you present as our guests and obviously the household of faith today. I want to introduce to you our speaker. Dave Cropper, let me just read his bio, then I'll say a few things. Born in the twin island of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Dave Cropper is, an emer is emerging as a global voice of transformation and restoration. His prophetic gift finds expression both in the corporate setting and within the body of Christ. Since responding to his call in ministry in 1994, he has been well received across eight nations and dozens of cities in the area of prophetic preaching, Bible teaching, leadership training, and business consulting. Dave has also spent most of his adult life as a successful entrepreneur. He's academically trained in TV production, branding, and communication, and also has a master's in business administration from the Anglican Ruskin University in London. In 2016, he co-founded the Biblical Learning Series, a biblical Bible teaching center where David served as one of the core facilitators. Today, he functions as one of the leaders in Numa Global Family, based in Johannesburg, South Africa. He is the author of the book, Cut Without Hands, The Emergence of the Government of Jesus Across the Earth. He is married to Dr. Maurice Cropper and has three children, Alexandra, Juliana, and Joshua, and is an avid golfer. He cannot believe that I live across the road from a golf course for 20 some odd years and I haven't played one game of golf. He thinks I'm not saved. <laughs> it would be great. Okay, I think we, we think. I met Dave online during COVID. I was part, uh, I attended together with Pastor Salvin a 10 week prophetic, creating prophetic culture series that was hosted by Anderson Williams. Shun Blucknot and other prophets were part of the speaking speakers, including Dave, who took one session. And um, immediately, my, my spirit resonated with his presentation. Following, we developed a relationship through um, being a support to a brother who had COVID. And at his behest, he asked me to, for one week, to engage from about 1 p.m. my time for half an hour, together with this minister of Christ who had COVID, was, had to isolate from his family was just going through something and needed daily encouragement. And he reached out to me, would you join me in meeting this person and just share prayer, prophecy, perspective, which we did. And it was in that, that week where I truly saw the man and his heart for relationships and for the body of Christ. Amen. And so, uh, like I said, he hails from Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Maurice is a veterinarian, a vet. So if anybody has any issues with your animals, you know, <laughs> you know who, who to see. And they're equally, I've come to discover in our brief association uh, over the, the yesterday and today, they are highly credible, highly substantive, very grace-loaded couple, uh, full of the wisdom of God, highly perceptive, and highly discerning of people, circumstances, but particularly the will of God for the present hour. Amen. So I want you to stand with me, and we're going to welcome Dave. Uh, Marisa, I'm not sure if you want to greet us first. Maybe we could say something before Dave ministers. But let's say together, blessed are they who come in the name of the Lord. Come on. Blessed are they who come in the name of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Hello. I'm going to try and make this quick. Um, thank you for welcoming us. Thank you for allowing us into your home and into your country. This is my first visit to South Africa, and I absolutely love it. Um, I hope it is not my last. Um, 
I just want to say that even as we were singing the worship song this morning, Speak the Word, um, I just felt as though even as we will all sit under the Word today and we will all hear the Word, that the Holy Spirit is so wonderful that he is able to take that one word that Dave will speak and touch each and every one of us in the place that we need, that we need it. And we don't need to know, you know, you don't need to know where, you know, the person next to you is at and what they are, but God knows. Amen. So as we sit this morning, just, you know, don't harden your hearts. Just open, just say, God, whatever. Just say, God, have your way. Just don't allow any little thing to come in, to mar, to be the spot. Just be open to him today because you have no idea what he is ready and waiting. It's like the picture I see is like a horse at a gate, at a horse race. And if you've ever seen it, before that gate is open, they are just ready to go they are just because they know what is ahead and they know what they need to do and that's what I feel like the Holy Spirit is at everybody's heart this morning he is just straining and he's waiting open the gate open the gate open the gate so open your gates this morning and allow him to just run where he needs to run Amen. thank you Amen. well good morning how are we doing Am I on? I'm almost there. I think I'm on. You can hear me. Everyone looks lovely this morning. You all look good. There's, um, yeah, there we go. We're getting there. I'm going to be walking up and down today. Is that okay? Come close to some of you guys. Hallelujah. Yep. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> nice. Well, can I call you Randall? This is my brother, you know. Let me say something about this brother. You know, I've come from the other part of the planet. But who he is, is like someone that I've known all my life because I know him after the spirit. I don't know his history. I haven't lived with him. But when I hear him speak, I know that this is my brother. And I trust that today, when I spend time with you all, that we will all hear our oneness in Christ. That we will hear the journey that we all partake in together as one people. What God is doing in this time is so unique that I'm really honored to be alive right now. Um, there's just so much. There's just so much that's happening. There's so much that's happening in this, in this fellowship, in this community, in this particular, and I want to use these words carefully, this particular expression of the kingdom because that's what gate is. It's a particular expression of the kingdom. And there are many expressions, many diverse expressions, but there's one Lord. Say one Lord. one Lord. I'm here today to just release stuff. I'm a communicator. I'm an interactor. So I'll be leaning into your lives. Sometimes God will show me stuff. Don't be afraid. Um, I have been called prophet. I was like, I've been called many things, but that's one of them. But let me just first say that I'm here for you. Amen. I'm not here for me. There's so many things that have led to me being here today that says to me, I am here because God wants to release something to you. Amen. From the finances that has come dramatically and supernaturally, to my health being where it needs to be, to just creating space in a very busy schedule, because I know that what God wants is for you to be at the place where he wants you to be. Everybody say the word payload. 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 You all know what payload is? You know what payload is? 
payload is when you're in the midst of the battle and your ammunition running low. There's a guy that straps munitions on his back and runs into the battle. And his job is to deliver to you the ammunition that you need in order to continue to fight. Everybody say payload. That's my job today. I'm here to deliver payload. Ammunition. I'm here to equip each and every one of us with some level of capacity that allows us to contend. We say contend. Contend. There's a, there's a contention that is real in the realm of the spirit that expresses itself in our natural lives. There's situations and circumstances arranging itself against us. Jesus oftentimes mentioned our adversary. I've taken instruction from that. To always be conscious of the fact that we have an adversary. Amen? I want to talk to you all a little bit about me first. Because you all meeting me for the first time. I'm just going to give you all just a little background context. So this is story time. So everybody relax. Let's just enjoy story time. We get to the word. The word is there. And this brother has already started. He's right inside of the scripture that I'm going to go. The context, everything. And that just allows what I'm going to say to just resonate even louder in the realm of the spirit. Amen. Amen. So this is Dave Cropper. I'm a young man. I, um, I'm here because of that which God intended a long time ago. At the age of 16, I had a visitor. I was minding my business as a young man, hanging out, chilling, doing what young men do. 16. And on my journey one Friday evening to head home, I felt an urgency. I'm not saved. I don't know the Lord. But for the season that I was alive at that age, there was a disquieting on the inside that I could not explain. And as I was in the city of Port of Spain, an urgency just came upon me, go home now, go home now. So I just left what I was doing, and I hurried to find the fastest route out of the city, jumped into a taxi. You know the, the, the buses, the minibuses, the crazy drivers? <laughs> was, uh, don't go in that one, go in a car. <laughs> <laughs> so I jumped into the car, and the driver of the car, he's sitting in front, and he's talking about the activity of God in the earth. Never heard anybody talk like that. And if this is where I started my journey, and this is the end where I have to be delivered, by the time I was here, everyone else within the taxi, they had their stop already. So it was just him and me alone in the car. So I challenged the man. I said, yo, how can you prove the authenticity of the Bible? You're talking about what God is doing. Me and my 17, 16-year-old arrogant self. I say you talk about this uh, like if you were at, around the time when these things happened and Moses and all of that stuff. And the guy said these words. He said, let me tell you something. The atmosphere in the car changed. I was like, what's going on in this car? The guy was a messenger sent. And he said, let me tell you something. I was sent to give you a message. So I was like, okay, what's the message? He said, I've followed you all of your life. I've been to places that tried to take me out. You've been here. You've been there. And the man begins to recount instances of where I've been. I had somebody watching over me. And he said, I have a message for you. And he said, the message I have for you is, God wants you to come to him. That's it. That's the message. I'm sitting in the car, and I'm trying to process this intellectually. He drops me straight in front of my house. He gives me a card, and he leaves. I say, okay. I go inside. And this is my first 16-year-old prayer. And I say, if you are God, 
you have the ability to reveal yourself unto anyone in the midst of the world with many voices. I say, you reveal yourself to me. That was the end of my prayer. I told God, you see, you reveal yourself. Nothing happened. Three weeks passed. I continued minding my business. And the same guy in the same car, I'm standing at the corner, and he drives by, and he looks at me, and he peers into my soul. And when that happened, something got switched on on the inside. I went back to God. And I said, you know what? I'm going to start reading the Bible. There was no altar call. There was no, is there one? Stand to your feet. There was none of that. There was the quiet, by myself situation of encounter. And as I began to open the pages of the book, the thing made sense. I began to hear the voice of God. I began to hear the voice of God so clearly that my sister would ask me, what is God saying? I have a question for him. Can you ask him for me? I, I would hear the voice of God in uncanny ways that I could not even understand. Why is it that I could hear heaven so clearly? It's weird. So I give my life to God. I started my journey. I started to connect with believers organically. And I was with this group, and one guy said, you know what? There's this church. I think you belong there. It's called the Elijah Center. They hear God too. <laughs> so I went. I walked in, and I heard the Lord say, and right here you shall put your bags down. And that was part of a journey to orchestrate the development of my life. I met Maurice there. I encountered a family that we have all been connected to at some point in time. Shall not mention any names. And the last time that I saw this, this gentleman that introduced me with the message, I had started my journey with God. But I used to suffer with migraine headaches as a child. And I had my first interview for my first job. And I was walking through the streets of Port of Spain, right where the same spot where I heard and sensed that I needed to, be, to leave urgently. And I saw the guy after months. I saw the guy. And I ran to him and I said, yo. I said, I walk with God now. And I'm standing in the midst of that same spot, Port of Spain, with a migraine. And I said, but I, I have a migraine. Can you help me? The guy held my hands in the middle of the town. He said nothing. He looked up to heaven. And I was immediately healed. He disappeared, and I've never seen him since. That's my journey. I have gone on to hear and see and understand all kinds of experiences in God. And when I thought that I was at the gate, ready to run, like my Reese was explaining, I was ready to run. I wanted to preach to the world. I wanted to see stuff happen. I used to lay hands on people and feel stuff, and I was all ready to go. And nothing happened with me in ministry. I have had encounters with the Lord. I've had dreams. God has shown me nations. 17, 18, 19, 20, we would pray all night and God would show up and all of that stuff. I'm 46. But I had to hold on to the promises of God for the intent of God for my life. And this is the season that I'm stepping into the nations with a different momentum. So right here, you all are looking at a miracle of God in the making. I'm not here by chance, and I trust that somewhere along the line that we will take encouragement to just wait on God. The faithfulness of God is beyond match. It is beyond what we 
can even reason in our minds that we are deserving of. It is the eternal intents of the kingdom to accomplish a thing way before your agreement. Let me say that again. It is the eternal intent of the kingdom to bring you to a place even before your agreement. God is the one that has predetermined what he will do with you and what he will do with you and how he will establish his will in your life and release capacity. There's a time to everything on the the heaven. Everybody say a time. Say a time. A time. time. And to everything there's a season. Say season. We release the seasons of God upon this house even right now. Let's agree to this. Father God, we lift our hands and we declare, this is a season of your arriving. Amen. This is a season of your descending. Everybody say descending. Descending, Descend, O oh God. Let your governmental capacity fill this place. Let the administration of your kingdom works flow from this house. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for there is nothing done under heaven that you have not approved. Everything you have set in order according to your power. Father God, we submit our lives to you afresh. Release new grace. Everybody say new grace. grace. For a new season. season. God, we understand that this is the time that you have appointed under heaven for our advance, for our growth, and for our development. And Lord God, we submit our lives to you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's get this. Thing moving. Eternal kingdom relationships. Let's talk about that today. Let's talk about the fact that we are in this room together. We are joined together by not choosing one another. The fact that God has chosen me and chosen you means that he's chosen us to be one in him. I didn't choose you. God chose you. I have a responsibility to see you and engage you based on how God sees you and engages you. This is, not my jo- this is not my choice, but we submit to what God is doing in each other's lives. Our bind that, that has been set, our, our knitting together, our coming together, our construct in the tapestry of God is by his design. He has appointed us to be in relationship one with another. I honor this woman of God because from her has come the seed of God's purpose to express itself in its right time. Everything that God has done to bring her to this stage and this season of her life is important. The significance of her presence Matters to me, matters to you, matters to all of us. I just thank God for her life. I thank God for the legacy that is on the inside of her life. I thank God for the seed of power that rests in silence. That without verbiage, but through lifestyle, the kingdom of God is released. I thank you for those that are matriarchs that speak to generations, that carry the womb of God on the inside, that both things through prayer. I thank you for what God has done in her and will continue to do through her. I thank you for that which is real. Everybody say real. Amen. This is real stuff. The eternal things of God are the things that matter, the things that don't change. God's truth does not change. With time, with season, it is forever and for eternity. The nature of God does not change. The truth of God's word is not subject to agreement in order for it to be true. The thing is self-establishing. And we want to walk in dimensions of eternity. Dimensions that God himself has fabricated because he is the word of God. He is not information. (laughs) His word is life and is light. And that's what we want today. The truth of our relationships is that our relationships in Christ are eternal. That thing is not temporary. That thing is not just, well, casual. But it is, it is real. 
I need my glasses. Where is it? <laughs> Let me do this. I want to talk about the landscape of our existence. From the perspective of structural integrity of our kingdom relationships and its redemptive impact. Do you know that the nature of our relationship impacts the environment? The way we relate one to another has a, an impact <laughs> on the space that God has called us to occupy. This is intended to provoke us to become a full representation of the standards and patterns of leadership that shape the region. This house is a shaping house, a house of impact. Our standards and patterns of leadership will shape this region and give it steerage towards the maturity of our unique call. That's a mouthful to say that who we are matters to where we are. Everybody say that. Say who we are, who we are. matters to where we are. I want us to hold that in our hearts. And let the quality of who we are remain present in our lives. That thing is not casual. Our configuration is not by chance. The divine arrangement of our call to a space and to a place and to a leadership and to a community is not accidental. It is divine. It is strategic. It is necessary for the advance of the kingdom. Your life matters to me. Who you are matters to the kingdom of God. I want us to look at one another through these eyes. Look at ourselves through these eyes, but look at one another through these eyes. Because this is why we're talking about eternal, eternal kingdom relationships. But there are now many parts, but everybody say one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Let's talk about this a little bit. The hand is the work, the reach, the grab, the handle. The eye is the sight that informs the handling. So let's say I want to do something. If I don't have the information that gives me accurate steerage of what I do, I'm, I'm just... I'm just doing stuff that make no sense. But if I have the sight of what to do, but I don't have the enabling of what it takes to get it done, all I have is sight but frustration. So when we talk about the, the relationship between the hand of the, and the eye, we talk about a relationship that once it comes together, it has the ability to produce. It has the ability to get stuff done. I want us to begin to understand that what God has done in our oneness is that he has brought together hands and eyes, Amen. capacity and sight, Amen. doers and seers, vision and enablers. The depth of this word translates into the nature and the fabric of a kingdom community at work that is in one accord. There's a role that allows us to have sight, but with sight alone and no enablement, there's no productivity. Say no productivity. And what God wants to do is to reconcile into one the nature of that which concerns our ability to see and our ability to do. That's why we need our leaders. That's why we need those that give steerage of our lives. Listen, leadership is a God idea, you know. We didn't invent this. Leadership capacity is God's plan. That's his wisdom. We're just functioning in it. This is eternal wisdom that doesn't change. Built into the nature of our own human frame. Rest the wisdom of the kingdom of God at work. The hand can't say to the eye, I don't need you because guess what? You're not doing anything. You're not going anywhere. You're not making any sense. No productivity. And in the same capacity, here's how the head to the feet works. Once again, it's a dynamic relationship between leadership, headship, and activity, mobility. Feet, the function of feet is to give us mobility, movement, 
advance. Could you imagine a head on the ground trying to roll itself into? That is nonsense. It doesn't work that way. There needs to be a connection between that which is the head. And who is the head? Come on, let's say it. Who's the head? And we are the feet. There is a oneness that has to operate in our midst. But there's a oneness that has to operate in the context of that which is heaven and that which is earth. This scripture speaks to divine synchronization. It's a synchronization. synchronization. That's what we're doing. Today is the day that we set a time to become resynchronized with what God wants to say to us to enable our mobility. This is not, these are not casual words. The Apostle Paul laid his hand upon a principle that defines the entire existence of the house of God and the people of God because the oneness is critical for our effectiveness and our mobility. This is payload, friends. This is the stuff that I want to recalibrate us today that is necessary for how we engage community life. Our leaders are critical to that which concerns our advance. This is no accident. This is no casual word. This is a word that says we pray for our leaders. You know why? Because we are one. If they go, if they go astray, we go astray. We have to lift up those that God has set over us to give us sight. You don't need to pray for me. Trust me. I am flawed. But I believe God. I believe in his word. I believe in the eternal life that he has set on the inside of me. I believe in the processes of God to arrive for me in time and in season. But processes don't happen without agreement. Everybody say agreement. Agreement. Which is why we need wisdom. Wisdom helps us to walk in agreement with what God wants. (laughs) Let's do this. Let's read 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren. How did I get there? Wow. This thing went all the way. Nope. You are going way ahead. (laughs) How did this thing get all the way? Right. Wow. It just jumped. Let's... Right. Let's get back where we need to be. Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaleah, now what happened in the month she's left, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, at Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came and asked concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity about Jerusalem. Came and you inquired, what's happening with these guys who survived? Rough time. But what's the state of their existence? We're in a rough season right now in the world. Things not easy. <laughs> and um, we are more than conquerors, not just survivors. The nature of our resilience, of our current existence, speaks to the fact that God has preserved us. Good to see you, brother. Now they said to me, the remnant in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress. Everybody say great distress. And reproach. Reproach is shame. We ain't looking too hot. Things rough. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are burned with fire. Gates speak to a particular functionality that's no longer active. Distress. Our capacity to function as gates. Not working. We ain't looking so hot right now. So 
So today I'm asking the question, what do we see when we look at the state of the kingdom community and the cities of the nation that we inhabit? When we look at the churches, not just inside of our walls, not just inside our personal sphere, when we look beyond, because the kingdom community represents all of us. When we look at some state of our brothers and how they've taken out, what do we see? Come on, church. When we look at Durban, what do we see in Durban? What's the state of Durban? <laughs> What's the state of the expression of the kingdom in Durban collectively? When we look at our collective presence in this place, what do we see in the nature of how one kingdom community relates to another kingdom community? What do we see when we look at, follow me, one hand community and one eye community? What is the nature of the relationship between those two? I perceive this to be community that has sight, God has poured in greatly into this house, that the Gate family is a family that has abundance of wealth and strength and grace. Apart from us, our brothers are a part of us. But when we look into them, what do we see? Hear the word of the Lord, huh? what do we see? When I heard these words, I sat down. Everybody say sit down. Yeah. I'm not moving right now. When I heard these words, my mobility must cease. When I hear that my brother is in distress, here's the accurate kingdom response. I ain't going nowhere. I sat down. I wept. I mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. That's an accurate kingdom response. When we see that there's a distress among our brothers. When we see that everything is in ruin in their space. If we don't enter into the distress that they're experiencing, we are hypocrites. If we sit and think that our lives are good. While our brothers are in distress, we have missed the kingdom. There's a heart tweaking that I believe is necessary as we begin to advance the things of God. Amen. And it starts with this posture right here. I sat down. Everybody say sat down. This is a sit down time this morning. <laughs> and our hearts weep for our brothers. That we can't just live in plenty while the gates, and this is gate central, lie in ruins. Listen, I, 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 I didn't know all of these things were going to be critical. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the midst of understanding what God is saying, and I'm just as wow as every time I encounter God's word. Because it is necessary. Listen, listen. Please hear my heart. God is looking at the posture of our hearts when we look upon our brethren. He's interested in what our response is when we see their situation. Did it happen again? Yes, it did. How did that happen again? <laughs> there you go. And it's gone. And it's back. And it's gone again. It's almost there. Where did you go? Let's see. It's taking me back. Right. Let's see. 
let's get it right back to where it needs to be. You're hurrying, man. Why is the presentation jumping like that? <laughs> There you go. I sat. Today I'm asking a question. How has this affected me personally? There it goes, it's gone again. And it's back again. How has this affected us personally and corporately? And what have we done? And what do we intend to do about it? You all know that the call of this house is unto reconciliation, right? I think we know that by now. But there's a strategic impetus and a clarity that I think becomes critical at this time, that we focus on what needs to be done. Not just what we have done in the past, but what we need to do moving forward. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor your statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Now, this is a house of commandments, statutes, and ordinances. We are a people that we, we are word heavy. We know the statutes, we know the commandments. Commandments are the instructions which ought to be done once understood. This is a house that receives very clear commandments. God speaks to us, do this now and do that now. The statue are the things engraved and prescribed in our hearts that remain, that we don't deviate from it. God is building in us statutes. And ordinances are the processes. We need right processes to bring us to execute the will of God accurately. There are processes, unique processes in our lives that God has that God is doing, that gets us to where we need to go to. But processes need to be submitted to and agreed with. <laughs> That's the hard part about process. We discern it, but we need to lend our agreement to it. Now, these three areas allows us to, to walk in the way that we need to walk. But sometimes we drift from these positions. Sometimes our brothers drift from these positions, and it causes them to arrive at ruin and destruction. This is where the deviation takes place. Why does this keep happening? <laughs> it's gone back again. Okay, get back, get back, get back. Where are you? Right. Come on, behave. Today I'm asking, as leaders, what do we need in order to rebuild and to keep our national community with the commandments, statutes, and ordinances? Everybody say rebuild. Rebuild. I told you, you're there already, brother. There's a rebuilding that we need to partner with. The excellence of our finished state, our mature state, is what God is after, not our incomplete state. Not just our individual state, but our collective state. The state of the kingdom community across Durban is our personal responsibility. We are responsible for our lives but we are also our brother's keeper. I'm just asking three questions. Those are just the three questions. What do we need in order to rebuild and to keep? See, so everybody say keep. That's important. It's not just important to rebuild, but to keep that which is rebuilt. To hold that which God has done to maintain the advance that we make. The journey of the people of God has always been advance, regress. Advance, regress. Obey, disobey. We're good today, we bad tomorrow. And God wants a pattern of continuity. Everybody say continuity. continuity. 
It started in David. It was looking good. The kingdom was hot. Everything was real nice. We had tabernacle experiences. The presence of God is spread abroad. We sing, we dance, we shout, and we shape the nation with culture. This is a little off script, but hear me, hear my heart. What was seeded in David? What started to represent the transformation of the entire society? As the king rose and worshipped God. As the songs were written and the culture built into the hearts of the people. And that's a technology that we have not even begun to touch today. To transform and to touch culture, we need the frequencies of heaven that express in worship to release culture. Listen, the technology to release that stuff was scribed in the book of Psalms and is real today. Jesus himself sang hymns. You all know that? And when they sung a hymn, he was releasing stuff in the atmosphere through worship. Now, this is not about that, but this is a house of worship. We release and transform culture through the things that we sing. David did that. And he established a standard and God covenanted. Listen, the seed of Christ itself came through Christ, came through David. The kingdom seed rests with him. Right now, we stand in a time where, hey, how do we have an impact and hold this impact through that which we release? <laughs> how does this transformation impact on our brothers through the creation of culture? Culture is the, is the reality that lives on the inside of our hearts that does not move. The culture is held within the Three things. You all remember the three? The commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances. I just pray that this be a house of kingdom culture. That as we sing, these words don't have emptiness, but they transform our lives. What started in David carried into Solomon, and then what? And then what? The thing fell. And that's what I don't want to see here. I want what God releases through the David era to be maintained. Every time the scripture talks about, and the servant David, they did not keep according to my servant David. Yeah. And Sunday, you see tomorrow we're going to deal with that. I'm going to just introduce it, but we're going to go somewhere where that is concerned. There's some things that were started in David that, that God wanted to continue in the house throughout his people. And there was a shift that took place to enable that to happen. And we're going to talk about that shift tomorrow. And I said to the king, if it please the king, let letters be given for me, for the governors of the provinces. Everybody say governors. Yes. Beyond the river. That they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. Everybody say Governors. This is the house of governors, you know. And there are other governors outside of this house as well. Letters to the governors. Permission slip. <laughs> Access has to come from the leadership capacity first. If the leaders don't agree to what God is doing, nothing is going to happen. There's no rebuilding without buying from leadership across the body of Christ. That's the reality. I need letters from leaders in order to rebuild. The leaders need to agree to rebuilding processes. Otherwise, nothing happens. That's the first thing that was necessary. The corporate collective buy-in and the release of capacity by leadership is necessary for the advance and the rebuilding of what God wants to do. Listen, I can't get a letter of access from one leader and not get from another. We ain't going nowhere with that. We need to sit with leaders and we need to talk about this collectively. We need to build buy-in. We need communicators, facilitators, joiners, that knows how to sit the leaders down and say, let's fix this problem. Let's give access to that which this region needs. 
Let the prayer from this house be one that says, let the leaders come together. As a facilitation house. Let us spearhead the bringing together of those that are the governors. Because every city has governors. Every territory has governors. Every territory has people that God has set aside that allow or deny access. Listen, we know all about allowing and denying access right here. (laughs) That's why we are gate. And it doesn't just stop with us alone. This thing goes into brothers that we pray that God would show us that carry access for this city. Listen, the access of the kingdom is not just with church people, you know. You all hear me well, you know. The access for kingdom advance rests with people that God call and establish them as governors within the city. We need divine favor in order to allow transformation of this space. These are the key words that are necessary to enable the rebuilding process. The governors. Everybody say governors. governors. When the Apostle Paul talked about prayer for leaders, this was no casual thing, you know. He understood that in order to allow the territory to be invaded for the kingdom of God, that there needed to be favor among the governors to allow access and free passage for the word of God to impact our space. The principles of truth are eternal. Say eternal. That thing is, is real today. There's a certain level of advance that we will have if we just stick to ourselves. (laughs) if we just allow a a wonderful time among those that are just in our immediate midst. But we need to discern the governors. They're governors. Governors provide access. Letters to the governors are intended to release natural and spiritual authority. Everybody say first the natural, then the spiritual that create buy-in and stop resistance to reach our destination. In order for the kingdom communities of the nation to be rebuilt as one unified, harmonized, this this is beautiful, yet diverse expression of Christ, the governors of the territories must endorse, everybody say endorse, and not resist this collaborative vision and an initiative. Amen. This house is a representation of that in many ways. And I want to just talk about this just briefly. The mere fact that we are sitting in a facility that's not owned by us. We walk in the midst of a favor from the governor right here. Amen. That's real, you know. Amen. Our impact in this natural space right now, physically, in this physical building, is because the favor of God was released through a governor that allowed or denied access for us to be here. You all understand this? But there are further dimensions of access (laughs) and further favor that we need in order for the full rebuilding. Because guess what? We have some brothers out there that have no favor. We have some brothers out there that are struggling. Some churches are not doing as well. In order for the kingdom communities of the nation, say the nation, Nation. the whole nation of God. I'm talking about that which is our collective responsibility, the state of our brother's existence. To be rebuilt as a unified, which means we are one. Harmonize means that when I when I strike C, you're not striking D. It means that you're not off key. It means that when we work together, the thing is sweet. It's sounding good. And when something's sounding good, we can dance it together. Which means the relationship with our brother is nice. Amen? Amen. Yet diverse. Diversity is the language of the kingdom 
especially when we come into maturity. Not sameness, you know. Yes. Diversity. Yes. In the book of Revelation, you know what it says? It says that there was a representation of every tribe and every tongue under heaven. God recognized diversity in the end. He recognized that there was a plurality and a collection of various streams of uniqueness. Not sameness. Everybody's speaking by the Spirit, but a unique tongue. There needs to be a harmonization and a synchronization that we agree with, with diversity. Amen. This house may be strong in one way, but how do we know the strength of the other houses? How do we know what is the hand and the eye relationship? Listen, we may have sight, but there's a level of enablement that comes when we relate to other houses. And this diversity is necessary for the tapestry of the kingdom to clothe his people as one people. Collaborative. A collaborative vision. You know what a collaborative vision looks like? It looks like we take time with our brothers to submit the vision that God has given us and to hear the vision that God has given them. And to allow that thing to be validated. So I have an evangelistic thrust. And I like to go into the city. And I like to sit with the orphans. And I want to build a house. And I want to do stuff like that. No, no, no. But we are into nations. We speak to governments. We rule in the high places. God has given us education and sophistication. <laughs> we are a nation of esteemed folks. We are a people of the mountain. Oh, you all are people of the valley. We missed it. God is a God of the mountain and of the valley. You may be a mountaintop dweller. That doesn't mean you're not connected to the valley dweller. It's one kingdom. Everybody say one kingdom. And a collaborative vision is when we all see the same thing together. I see you as important and you see me as important. That doesn't happen accidentally, you know, brother. Listen, that thing takes work. And it takes a release of the Spirit of God to bring us together to say that we are committed to walking together. That's a move of God that we're defining right there. A move of God that speaks to our hearts and releases our internal capacity to see one another in a certain light. There's a move of the Spirit that's beyond our individual effort that allows us to connect accurately and to see our brothers accurately. This is a house of prayer. We are people of prayer. But the eyes of our understanding being opened is something that we need to continue to labor in God. Our adversary, remember him? Steal, kill, and destroy. Steal vision, kill vision. Destroy vision. Work of Christ. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to do what? To preach the what? Of the what? The kingdom. What, what happens when we set captives free? Anointed me to preach. There's a declaration that sets people free. Releases people from blindness. How many times have we seen in scripture that Jesus was healing blind people? He had a particular thing. Remember that scripture? There's something that David hated. Two things. The what? Say it again. The The lame and the blind. Sight is critical. Collective vision is important. It's important that my brother sees me accurately as well. That who I am, him, is who I need to be to him. 
You all still with me? It's some tough stuff in there, but you all following me? Amen. Say amen if you agree. Amen. amen. How much more time do I have before we take a pause? Ten minutes. Let's go. We're going somewhere, you know. We're going somewhere. We're going somewhere good. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he gave me timber. Everybody say timber. timber. <laughs> wood. You all know I, I do woodwork too. I actually, actually work with wood, you know. I fabricate stuff and build stuff. As a, a late gift that has found expression in this time. <laughs> timber. To make beams to the gates. <laughs> the gates of the fortress, which is by the way, which is by the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house to which I will go. Man, we need timber for all of these things. We need timber for the beams to the gates of the fortress. We need timber for the wall of the city. Three capacities. And we need timber for the house to which I will go. I'm going to say that again. We need timber for the beams to the gates. The beams are the pillars. The gates of the fortress. Say fortress. This is very important. The wall of the city and the house to which I will go. We need timber. Everybody say we need timber. We need timber. We need timber. There's no rebuilding without fresh timber. <laughs> we could talk rebuilding from now till the cows come home. But we need timber. <laughs> we need timber. Timber in Old Testament scripture represents us people. They call the people of God. People. What we need is people that are called to take their place in the new structure of the city of God. Keepers of the King Forest manage the access, the access to and connect us to the people we need. Let me tell you all something about timber. You all know that we are the city that God is building. If we are the city, then we are the timber. If some of us are broken down, what happens? Then we are broken down. The state of the city, what the scripture is saying is our state, is the nature of our relationships. The timber that we need in the new city that has to be rebuilt, the new wall, the new house, is us. We don't need actual wood, you know. The spiritual house that God is building is us. We are the spiritual house that God is rebuilding. We are the ones that need to be rebuilt. It is the nature of our relationships that has been burned. Listen, a gate is where the access is allowed or denied. And that is, we cause that. <laughs> we allow, an access, allow, allow access and deny access into other people's lives, you know. We are the ones that allow people to step into a new reality that creates a portal of entrance for Christ, you know. That's our job. That's what the kingdom of God does. We provide the entrance of the kingdom into the lives of the city. That's us. That's our job. You <laughs> and me together. When we are built right, we allow access and deny access. Here's what Jesus said. He said, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth. How does God release the kingdom purpose of God in the earth. By himself? <laughs> Through us. 
Remember that hand and that eye? Well, eyes are, when last I checked, eye is in a head, right? He gives us the sight and we are the hands. There's that synchronization between the head and the feet. He's the head and we are the executors. Somewhere along the line, we need to discern very, very clearly that the thing that God is focusing on and rebuilding is us. Amen. The focal point of the rebuilding of what God is doing is a reconfiguration of who we are collectively. Amen. When we are rebuilt and built right, there's a representation of the kingdom and an access and a functionality based on our collective building that allows God to do what he wants to do. When we stand together accurately, God can move. Yeah. And God wants to move. When we see the state of Durban and we ask ourselves, why hasn't God moved in Durban? Why hasn't crime been addressed? Because we're not built right. Why hasn't the kingdom descended upon this space without measure? Because we need to get rebuilt. Why hasn't the access come to touch the dark places of this city? Because we need to be reconfigured to all of that. And the purpose of rebuilding the wall, the beams, the house to which I will go, is to allow the king of glory access into the space. Our shape and our configuration matters to the effectiveness of the kingdom impact in this space. I hope you all hear my heart. That there's no effective building that arrives at nothing. Or an effective building arrives at kingdom impact. The destination of our collective building together is so that God has a place to function from. The point at which we have discerned that we are burned with fire is the point where we stop, we sit, we weep, we fast, we come before God, and we say, build us again. Because we want you to show up for our city. We want the kingdom representation to be strong in the midst of this city. We want Durban to look upon this and say, wow, I see that God has built something that can represent him. Amen? Amen? We'll take a pause. We'll jump back in. Take a little, a little break. It's going to get a little tougher in the second session, but we're going to land in a nice place. Amen? Amen. We, are the timber. we are the timber. We are the timber. Amen? Thank you. Blessings. Wow.